Welcome to Goodfellas History. I'm your host, Nick. Davis. And I'm Garrett. And today we're going to talk about modern monetary theory. What it is, what it's not, the history of it, and the policy's effects. So as you can see here, the big thing about MMT is it addresses the deficit myth. Okay, so the first question is, why do we pay taxes? It funds things. It funds Thanks. things, it allows us to pay for things, and it allows the government to get you to do things without putting a gun to your head. Because it pays you with money that it produces. And in exchange, the government expects you to pay it back with taxes. There we go, yep. So the next question is, what makes a dollar worth a dollar? Well, I would think it's part of the government. Ooh. Yeah, the market. Okay. This gets up to us up to Warren Mosler. Warren Mosler is kind of the founding father of modern monetary theory. And the big thing with Warren Mosler is he's not an economist. He was actually just a guy that worked uh, that was involved in the stock market. He made monies. And he began to ask himself where all these monies were coming from. And that's when he realized his big epiphany moment was that the government really doesn't need our money. It produces its, its own money. So what does it use this money for? Why do we need to tax people? And this gets to the parable of a time where he was with his kids during the summer vacation in his beach house. He had his kids with him and he wanted them to do chores in the house. And so... Uh, one way he was able to do it is he told him he wanted to do these chores, and in exchange for doing these chores, he'd give them his business cards, which apparently were really th fancy or really nice. Um, important thing about this, though, is that uh, the kids really didn't care about the cards, so the chores weren't done. So Mosler went to his kids and they're like, hey, why aren't you doing these chores? I'm giving you these cards. And the kids were like, uh, they're useless business cards. Why would we want them? So, in exchange, he changed, in, after that exchange, he changed his uh, strategy, and he now tied those business cards to privileges. So, in order for the kids to enjoy watching TV, using the pool, and various other things at the house, they had to exchange a certain amount of business cards every week to be able to do those. And doing certain chores or doing certain things would reward them a certain amount of business cards. After the end of the week, if they came up short with business cards, they wouldn't be allowed to do certain things. But if they did have those business cards, then they would be allowed to use those things. This is a perfect good example of what Mosler was talking about. So, kids and cards. Who knew? What's really funny about this and is that, you know, my parents had a system like this too. I think we all kind of have a, a, a story of our parents doing something like this, where they would reward us in something that essentially was worthless, but we had to collect it over time. And um, if we got, like, say, straight A's in school, what would happen? You get rewarded. You get yeah. rewarded. Yeah. And what's, so we could also think about a lot of things that are way. So an A really isn't worth anything except it is a G GPA, you, you know. It's your grade point average, right? So... It, it, so what he's basically getting at here with, with kits and cards is that the cards have no innate value whatsoever. Um, but it mattered to the kids because the kids needed to have the cards to pay for things that they wanted. And the only person that provided those cards was the dad. Ironically enough, this is actually a lot like medieval Europe. And it was basically like this throughout history. So L. Randall Ray... This fellow right here is actually a professor, and he actually took uh, Mosler's findings and applied it to an academic discipline. And the biggest thing he found out about this, and the biggest question he got out of this, um, is that it's not value in money, it's actually the money value that matters. And who historically has decided money's value? It has always been the government. So... Um, a good example of this, of course, is beads with Native Americans. So the Native Americans um, would exchange goods and resources for what? 
be all sorts of different, like, I don't want to say commodities, but, like, goods. Well, they'd exchange it for beets. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they exchange for beets. What did beets signify? Currency. Currency. Or tokens of friendship. Mm -hmm. So, usually when you came to a village or a community within the Native Americans and they rewarded you with beads, you usually were treated with a considerable amount of hospitality. You'd be able to stay with them. You'd be able to exchange with them. You'd exchange goods and resources. Sometimes you'd even exchange beads with one another for certain things. This allowed for trade to take place. So the earliest tokens of currency that we see in Native American society actually kind of lines up a lot with, a lot with anthropological studies of token exchange. Now, why did these tokens come about? Well, uh, Professor Ray also talks about the fact that currency came about due to blood feuds. So if, say I have seven fish and Davis has eight eggs, how do we decide how much eggs are worth the fish and fish are worth the eggs? Well, it's just us. It would be between us. And let's say that my fish are a little bit older than I say they are. And I give them to you. How mad would you have gotten once you found out that the fish you had were not really worth anything? I'd probably throw hands. So there'd be bloodshed. Yeah. <laughs> I would have to be, unfortunately, I'd have to kill you, you know, to defend myself. <laughs> yeah. You know? And is that good for a community? No. Very destabilizing. Do you think a village chief wants, you know, their people killing each other? Definitely not. So, some of the earliest forms of laws are about stuff like this. The village chief gets to decide, or the chief gets to decide, what what is worth. Why? A, they are the strong man, so they're a position of authority. Okay, and B, they are an elder given that position of authority. But either way, it's a position of authority coming in and deciding the value of things. Well, the problem with that is that it initially leads to favoritism. So it's so much easier to have a resource, a commodity, if you will, that you can use that is valuable to most people, either due to it being rare or it being pretty. This is where precious metals come into play. Beads and gold and silver. The people are willing to exchange their eggs for gold and silver. But gold and silver weren't always, historically speaking, coins. What were they? They were jewelry. Oh. Nice things. These tokens were things that people wanted to have. Well, the more trade you have, the more movement you had, you kind of want to have things that are actually a little bit easier to handle. All the while, those institutions of authority, the government, still stay in existence. They just evolve over time. So this eventually leads to the medieval era where we have tally sticks. Tally sticks um, basically were a, a unit used for accounting. How much you owe the government, how much the government owed you. Um, have you guys ever heard of tally marks? Yes, of course. Okay, that's where these come from. So for every mark, you owe this much X, Y, or Z. The government's the one that decides what that X, Y, or Z is. So whether it's pounds in grain or pounds of silver, the government is the one that decides what that is. It is kind of funny, though, that what kind of unit of measurement does the British government use for its currency? And this is one of the oldest currencies in the world, mind you. Pounds. Yeah, it's pounds. It's pounds, okay? Now, why is that so important? Because pounds are, generally speaking, a pretty easy you know, thing to weigh. Yeah, yeah. It's measurement. as if the state is able to weigh and measure the amount of silver you have or the amount of grain you have in pounds. Funny, right? Yeah, interesting. So if you actually look at it, historically speaking, uh, coinage has always been usually in reference to some sort of weight or measurement in weight when it comes to the value of the coins. 
a Schmeckle is a Libra. These are all units of measurement that they use also in grain. We use the, the pound system because we were heavily influenced by the British. So that leads to Stephanie Kelton. Now she's the writer of the book that we saw up top. Um, she is the person that really introduced me to the concept of modern monetary theory. Um, and her arguments, I think, are really sound and really reasonable. One of the first ones is a dollar tax does not equal a dollar saved by the government. Now, why is that? Because they issue the, the dollar. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. not really going to like sit on that anyways. Mm -hmm. It's useless to them. Why does the government want its own paper money? Why does it want its own digital currency? It's useless. They're not going to be able to use it. They can exchange that tax for a service, but that's still not saved by the government. The government doesn't have some large pig, piggy bank that's like a Scrooge McDuck vault, right? Yeah. yeah. So that money is just basically out of the market. It exists, so it influences the value of currency in general, but it's just not doing anything. It's just sitting there. Okay. And this is a really great one that I like too. One dollar spent but not taxed stays in the market. I love that because it's true. If the government spends more than it takes in, where does all that extra money go? Back into like, well, the market. Yeah. It goes back into the market. So what she's really getting at here is that the issue isn't that we have deficits. The issue is where those deficits are going. She quotes in her book and in many of her uh, many of her lectures that not all deficits are made equal. So a good example of this: deficits for spending for infrastructure versus deficits spending on war. Those two things are both deficits. They might actually even cost about the same. But are they the same thing? Close. And the cost of these things are exponential due to the fact that one is pulling out of society to finance something that society's largely not going to get anything back from, where the other one is going to invest into society, the community at whole, who in turn benefits from that because that money goes into their local markets. If those local markets are able to save up and generate enough wealth, what happens? It leads to expansion. So in both cases, the government's going into a deficit, which means it's going to contribute to the debt, but both are not made equal. So let's also add on top of that, cutting taxes and going to war. Okay. The government, instead of raising taxes to pay for those things because it wants to keep a deficit neutral um budget or a a a a a, uh, a cost neutral budget what does it do it borrows money the treasury as well as the united states government or the fed sell things things called bonds now what's the difference between a bond and a dollar in the bond like you're like owning a portion of something well now a bond is a um, is a currency in and of itself. So if I purchase a war bond from the United States government, what does that mean? That means that I now hold essentially a savings bond with them. I own a piece of currency that I might not be able to use to go out and buy eggs with, but it's a piece of currency that actually increases in value over time. Why? Because that the pay me interest for holding that bond. So the government, a good way to think about this, and this is what Stephanie Kelton says, think of bonds as yellow dollars and think of regular currency as green dollars. Okay? When the government spends, say, $100 and only taxes back $90 back from the United States government, that's 90 green dollars leaving the market. If the government wants to make sure that it covers all of its expenses, it can sell 
10 bonds or yellow dollars to someone in exchange for green dollars. Now we can see a problem with this. And what's that problem? Who has most of the money? Wealthy people. I was going to say, the person who ever, whoever's buying that too. So the wealthy benefit from this because they're able to purchase bonds. You know who's yeah. never had a failed treasury bond sale? Hmm. The United States government. Yeah. T-bills are by far and away some of the most highly prized commodities ever. So all that debt that you see that the Republicans and many people talk about, that debt is somebody owning a percentage of U.S. debt. That's wealth generated in our market. A good way to think about this is that all that debt is all the money that was still in our market that the government wasn't taxing out of that market. But that money isn't going to wealth to um, enrich the American people. It's going to who? The rich people. The rich people could own bonds. Yep. So this leads to the myth. The myth is the United States government can never run out of money. It just can't. The picture of the Uncle Sam holding an IU, IOU with a broken piggy bank isn't true. It's never been true. There's never been a point in human history where this is true. The government spending money on things does not inherently cause inflation. Nor does it crowd out investor spending or investor funding. So this gets to the recession that never seems to end, the crash of 08. And the failures of that, how our economic establishment kind of fell on its face and what MMT has to say about that. First of all, MMT argued, would argue that the reason why the crash was so pernicious and so bad is that so much wealth was already extracted from the United States public that they had to rely on credit or red dollars as a way of supplementing their incomes. Mortgages have a lot to play in that, especially when people had to double up their mortgages. So when the crash took place, nobody had any money. The public itself did not have any money to basically circle out all the bad mortgages, all the debt that had been generated from that. This required the United States government to step in. And what did the United States government do? What about like the bigger companies, yeah? It did TARP. Troubled Asset Relief Program. It bailed out the people who owned those assets. And the funny thing about people who own assets, they tend to also own bonds. So it was a bailout for the rich in this country. Now, yeah. the plus with that is that a lot of retirement pensions and a lot of other uh, actually positive pension programs that everyday Americans had were also caught up in this. So by doing TARP, it bailed out those pension programs. But the problem is, after they did TARP, the United States government did nothing to really rein in Wall Street. And more importantly, right after Wall Street just got bailed out by the Fed with TARP, with the Troubled Asset Relief Program, which government authorized the Fed to finance, okay, the United States government turned its back on homeowners and basically allowed the banks to rank them over the coals. So when Timothy, Timothy Geithner famously said that the United States taxpayers did not bail out the banks, he is technically correct. Taxpayer money did not go to bail out the banks. But public money, or the government's money, went to go bail out the banks. So in a sense, the people's money was used... It just wasn't our tax money. So, after this debacle, next slide, what the Democrats got wrong? Well, they fell into the austerity myth. This idea that you could cut your way into prosperity. 
that if you cut spending now, that'll lead to fewer and fewer problems in the future. Problem with that. Most of the people that were negatively impacted by the recession were Word working class. Working oh, class people. Working class and small business owners and farmers. They were the people that were hit the worst by this because they were the ones that had to rely the most on credit because their incomes, the wealth that they were generating over the last couple of decades, had stagnated. They are using credit as a means of offsetting the costs of living. When your credit market collapses or when finance collapses, that tends to affect them pretty bad. So the Democrats fell into the austerity myth. And then they began to make bad arguments for why they went along with it. Have you guys ever heard of the Grand Bargain? Only by name. I, I don't know, honestly so know what it was like the about. The Grand Bargain was in exchange for tax increases, for cuts to Social Security and other welfare programs. Oh. And yeah, they, they pitched this forward. This was a huge deal. The Democratic Party spent, I want to say, somewhere around four years trying to go for this Grand Bargain until finally the Democrats lost the Senate in 2014 and Obama spent the last two years of his presidency doing whatever the hell he was doing. Another problem with this is that this opened the door to the right. So the right wing began the Tea Party movement. And the Tea Party movement was two parts conspiracy, proto-Nazi BS, and two parts actual legitimate people having legitimate grievances about, well... A lot of things the government was doing, pointing out the fact the United States government kind of chose to uh, bail out Wall Street and bail out, well, certain homeowners and certain businesses and certain people while leaving everybody else out to dry. And so in return for this, the Democratic Party got attacked from the left and the right during this period of time. And this led to a person that we all know and love. Glenn Beck becoming a public figure. Glenn Beck, Fantastic. Glenn Beck kind of became the face of a group called the Tea Party. And, T, and the Tea Party stands for Taxed Enough Already. And yeah, they were all kind of full of crap. Yeah. Be a, uh, Glenn Beck definitely full of crap. Um, and they got everything wrong. They were austerityists. The problem that Glenn Beck had with the uh, with Obama and the Democrats wasn't that they were being too austere, is that they weren't being austere enough. They weren't cutting enough. They weren't squeezing enough. They were crusaders for liquidation, purging anybody and everything that was not uh, financially sound. So, a lovely bunch of people with lovely ideas. Um, there used to be this sticker that I saw when I was up in Idaho, and it was pretty popular amongst Tea Party types. And what it said is, your mortgage is not my problem. Yeah. It kind of flips the whole this. thing, it kind of flips the whole thing, whole narrative on its head now, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, the Democrats lose power. They lose a lot of power, actually. Um, to the point where the Republican Party is able to take back the House of Representatives. A large portion of the Republican Party are now Tea Party Republicans. Now, we have the squad, which is really nice. It's about seven to eight people. Hopefully nine with Nina Turner winning in August. Um, the Tea Party Republicans numbered around 100 to 120 people. So their amount of clout and influence within the Republican Party, let alone Congress, was pretty pronounced. So when I say that they opened the door to the right, the Tea Party were some of the worst uh, proto-fascists out there, if you will. Of their ranks, there was uh, Representative Wilson from South Carolina who openly told President Obama that he lied. Um, there were the uh, major dog whistle campaigns about the legitimacy of Barack Obama um, as being actually a native-born American. I remember that. And oh. the Tea Party kind of gave rise to um, the Donald. To answer this crusade that was launched and kind of was still on the move, um, the Democratic Party chose Hillary Clinton in 2016 to answer the Donald and his Tea Party slash uh, birtherist crazed um, conspiracies. 
I really love this picture, um, this book, What Happened, Hillary Rodham Clinton, because I think it's an apt parody on the fact that she's what happened. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, that's the book that gives lefties oh. nightmares. It is, it is a very uh, self-serving book that ironically kind of just opens the door to its own ridicule. So the problem with Hillary Clinton is that she took all these same bad politics and doubled down with really bad policies to address these issues. I don't know if you guys remember, but in 2016, Americans were kind of finally fed up with a recovery that never seemed to affect them. And yep. uh, she was the candidate that said everything was already fine. Yeah. America's did, already great. America's already great. The Trump supporters are just a basket of deplorables. I, I remember the day she said that, actually. Oof. So we can safely say that she had a really failed campaign. She never toured the Rust Belt. Many of those states flipped from being Democrat strongholds to voting for Donald Trump. But what her campaign really did is expose the myth of expert infallibility. So she had probably the best minds and best people available to her campaign. All the right people endorsed her. All the right universities and right papers endorsed her. She was the experts candidate. And these are the same experts that advised the push to austerity, the Iraq war, TARP, budget cuts, so these are the same people that kind of were the architects of the pain and suffering that average Americans had been going through for arguably the last 30 to 40 years. So really not popular. It's all, the, all the way around bad decisions. All the way around bad decisions. And it kind of just exposed this. Because all the experts said that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And it's just going to be a, a landslide. And yet, time and time again, they were proven wrong. This also happened in Britain with Brexit. This also happened in France with Le Pen. This happened in Germany with the alternative for Deutschland. Are we beginning to see a, a pattern here? All the experts said austerity was a good idea, that cutting social spending would be a good idea, right after one of the worst financial disasters in human history. So yeah, this leads us to our demagogues, especially the Orn dipshit that we just got rid of. And they used f legitimate fears that people had about what was happening to them and the deficit myth to take power. Now, part of that deficit myth is that we need to run the U.S. government like a household. So... One of the most famous lines that Trump ever said was that we were going to build a wall and Mexico was going to pay for it. Yep. Why on earth would we want pesos? And by definition, it would be Mexico's wall because the Mexican government was the one that would be spending and paying and building it. Yeah. The deficit myth allows people in positions of power and other demagogues to use fear and this myth to push their narratives forward. We can't spend money on empowering local communities of black and brown people because of the debt. We just have to basically cordon ourselves off and build walls around these people because they're scary. Yeah. It opens the door to demagogues like Trump, but also open up the doors to other demagogues like Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan. Yep. And Rand Paul. Mm -hmm. So, what's wrong with tax cuts? Really nothing. It depends on who's getting the money and where the money is going. If it's just the elites that are getting the tax cuts, well, that's the problem with the tax cut. It's not that there's less money going into the government. It's that that money, instead of circulating in the market, is just going into a savings account. Allowing that person to purchase more and more assets, taking more and more ownership of markets. 
inflating the value of their assets and is naturally destabilizing. And at the same turn, it also gives them more power over people because they now have more wealth. So that's the issue. So let's go into why Trump failed. And that's where we have this nice cartoon. Your greed is hurting the economy. And it's this rich dude that is standing on top of a mountain of money, pointing at a woman of color who says raising the minimum wage. Raising well, the minimum like wage. I've seen that many times. Yeah, well, some of the reason why Trump failed was that his economic boom was like many other economic booms, all flashed with no bang. So, really, inequality spiked. People were working harder for less, as usual, and wages remained relatively stagnant. There was some wage growth that took place, but it was nowhere near the rate of inflation that was taking place. This meant that people were basically working longer hours and having to take on more jobs and bringing home dollars that were worth less than they were, say, two years ago. This adds to the whole fact that some of the reasons why we are dealing with this more right now is people's wages have not kept pace with the cost of things. Credit has dried up, so there's no resources for everyday people to turn to to offset the cost of their living. This leads to the fake populists who seem to have answers to this. We have our faux hayseeds like Tom Cotton who wants to pretend that he is a man of the people from way back yonder, despite the fact that he's just as deep in the corporate pocket as anybody. We have white nationalists like Tucker Carlson who, well, is a white nationalist and is one of the same people who say that, oh, I wish we could do nice things, but oh, we just got to worry about those scary people they're the issue. They're the ones that are actually antagonizing racism. He's also the most watched newscaster in America right now. So, mm -hmm. And we have our Assad apologists and our Nazbol populists. People like Max Blumenthal and Jimmy Dore, who really have taken their eye off the ball quite a bit when it comes to the domestic policies. We've heard more about the quote-unquote fake Duma gas attack than we had about, well, what's going on economically speaking in this country. I know Max Blumenthal and uh, Aaron Monte are not um, economic journalists, but it does seem kind of interesting that they are fascinated with a supposed false flag operation in Syria, but are not interested about the long-term ramifications of the economic um, consequences of the region as a result of the financial crash, and how that actually further radicalized the region, arguably even more than the Iraq war, because people were out of jobs. People often forget that the rise the Arab Spring was generated less by the Iraq War, but more due to the fact that austerity and other programs were being forced down their throats, which led to joblessness. Who are the number one supporters of toppling the Assadist regime? Men between the ages of 18 and 35. Hmm. Because they didn't have jobs. Another problem with these guys is they push the narrative, the narrative of the DSA is actually working in tandem with U.S. imperialism. That being a democratic socialist is somehow the equivalent of being an imperialist. Yeah. So basically trying to cripple potential left-wing economic reform. Who does that benefit? corporate America. Yep. So these, these brave tooth-tellers about U.S. imperialism who hate U.S. corporate greed are also acting as stooges for U.S. corporate greed by trying to delegitimize left-wingers. It's funny that. This now leads us to Biden and the left. So what can he do? Well, we have the infrastructure deal that we talked about in the $3.5 trillion budget that Bernie Sanders was able to release. So there's a lot of things you could do with that. The biggest thing that I see with this is it's an incredible appeal to the base of the Democratic Party. Now, what does this have to do with MMT? Well, it just basically points out the fact the United States government could generate $4.1 trillion worth of debt or deficit spending to invest in our local economy. And many, many economists see this as a net benefit. The only downside is the possible rise of inflation. 
But this also leads us back to our old friend Joe Manchin, who really has no grasp of how economics work. But if there's enough of this money that's going to his corporate donor's pocket, I'm pretty sure he'll be quite on this. But that remains to be seen. The infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion bill are good because it's going to produce jobs, clean energy, and financing for people. I'm calling it the Sanders budget. Why? Because Bernie Sanders is king. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So this is a perfect example of MMT. Now, why Bernie Sanders is a huge part of this is he's the one that took MMT to the mainstream. Bernie Sanders was the first person to really tie himself to the MMT. In fact, uh, Stephen Kelton was his, his economic advisor. Uh, when he, in the 2016 and 2020 campaign. She also was his economic advisor as senator for Vermont. So if you really look at what Bernie Sanders is pushing, it basically has its basis in MMT. The Green New Deal, major investments in deficit spending to generate a new industry in our economy that is designed to basically offset CO2 and uh, pollution. Medicare for All, a massive investment in people's health and welfare, hopefully reducing the average cost of people's lives and reducing the cost of living for everyday Americans. The infrastructure bill that we just got done talking about and a jobs program. Something that would be designed to basically finance and train people and give people a living. Because with those jobs programs, what are they going to be doing? They're paying they're taxes. In, yeah. but, they're, but they're going to be doing things that we want them to do. Mm -hmm. Whether it's infrastructure, the climate change core, or whatever have you. The expansion for Medicare for All is probably going to require a lot of people stepping in to fill in the gaps. As medical, well, as medical services expand. Yeah. So, I have a nice picture here of a, a union placard. United we bargain, divided we beg. You guys have any questions? I think so. It's just interesting to kind of see how, like, like talk about, like, money regulation and, like, kind of the benefits of, like, having more mobile money, honestly. Yeah. And I, I think you broke it down pretty well. I don't think I left anything unanswered. I think I, you know. I can go in a little bit detail um, down the road. But, I mean, the biggest thing I want people to take away from this is that um, we oftentimes have a finite understanding of money. And a lot of that is conditional. Because most of us, our relationship with money is an ends to a, a means to an end. We have money to spend on things that we need. Yeah. And once we spend that money, it, it disappears to us because it's no longer ours. We no longer have it. It's it's gone now. It's back in the market. Yeah. Whereas with governments, it doesn't work that way. Hence why all dollars are legal tender. Yeah. So... All the money that exists in our economy technically is the property of the United States. Its value, which it represents, the dollar, is what you're allotted, is your personal value. And that basically represents your purchasing power. How much, yeah. how many dollars you have available to you to purchase things. And what those dollars are invested in. Usually the wealth, when you see people like Jeff Bezos, it's not a McDuckian bank account that they have. It's actual properties and, and assets that they own that are worth a certain amount of dollars. Yeah. So a lot of people kind of get twisted where they think, oh, Jeff Bezos has one point blank million, billion dollars to, to spend at any given time. When in fact, no, that's what he owns. That's how much of the economy he owns. That's how many things he owns. So, I want... One thing I like about MMT is that it does reshape how you perceive the economy. But there is something I will have to say is that it is limited in its scope and ability. Um, it is not a silver bullet. Um, MMT economists also say that deficits with no end and just spending money like drunken sailors still isn't a good idea because inflation can still happen. It's just that what many of them argue is that 
the government spending money in areas that have not been affected or not been benefited or right now are troubled is an investment that's worth time and it's worth the effort and worth the cost because those dollars are going to be reintroduced into those markets. It's naturally going to lead to some level of inflation, but inflation itself is not the issue. The, we, we just don't want is uncontrolled inflation or out of control inflation. And the number one cause of inflation is scarcity. Yeah. So we don't want too many dollars chasing too few goods. So. Yeah. Well, and can we also talk about, just real quick, to throw something out there, my, I won't say how, I don't want to, like, say my connection to this person on, uh, but basically this person that I know to this other person, mm -hmm. an older dude, said that you should be saving 50% of your paycheck. Well, it's like kind of nice to live in the 1960s. Well, yeah, but basically saying that 50% of your paycheck should go to your savings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's basically what richer people are doing or people who lived kind of back in the day. But then 50% of your income isn't going back out into the market. Well, it does because most of us have bank accounts, right? And banks take this money, and what do they do with it? They lend it, right? That's if you have your money in a bank account. I'm sure exactly. some of these people have it in like their mattress or something. Yep. Yeah, but I mean, most people have their excess savings in a bank account or in an asset, so in an investment. Yeah. So what this person is saying is not 100% wrong. Um, but it's unrealistic. But it's unrealistic because most people don't have the financial means. So this gets back to that, that spending power, right? If people's spending power matched to where we were in the 1980s, yeah, it would make sense to save a quarter to half your paycheck so that you had excess money saved up so you could buy nice things. The problem is the cost of living and the expense of goods and commodities have increased over time as well, while our purchasing power has remained stagnant. Like I said, in the 90s, people were able to offset that with credit. But we don't yeah. have that anymore. Credit has dried up. Yeah. So, that's the problem with that. Most arguments for austerity are counterintuitive because if, and it gets back to this, if you try to save money by not spending as much money, it benefits you specifically. But let's say you, me, and Davis all stop spending money and everybody else in the country stops spending money, what's going to happen to those markets? What's going to happen to our economy? They're going to shut down. It's going to shrink, right? Yes. So what's beneficial to you is systemically problematic for everyone else. So this was the problem yes. with trying to push austerity in the middle of a recession. It basically prevented a recovery from taking place because people were seeing their expenditures cut, credit dried up, and then the government talked about cutting spending. Yeah. Which some of it did come through. And the people most vulnerable during this recession are also the same people that saw those benefits cut. So this made it impossible for people to reinvest into the economy and back into the market. So this led to a period of time between 2010 to about 2015 where growth was very minimal and we saw a lot of jobs gain but purchasing power remained the same our economy didn't seem to recover it, yeah. it was a big problem and that's some of the reasons why the anger blew up the way it did in 2016 yeah so this is once again kind of that like the idea that um to try to take for granted this idea um of what seems common sense might not actually be that reasonable and why having a bigger picture is more important because it requires a more nuanced take of our economy yeah so you guys have anything i think that's it for me uh yeah i mean i love the idea of mmt i think like i said you broke it down really beautifully and i you know, and kind of happy Sanders kind of threw it into more mainstream. Although I don't, I'm, maybe not the term itself, but the ideas mm -hmm. kind of with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, it makes sense to me. So. Okay. Well, this has been Goodfellas History. If you like what you heard and you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe down below. 
and be sure to smash that like button. It wants it. And y'all have a great day. <laughs> Thanks right, for watching, guys. guys.